Nunes calls out two parody accounts, which she says have repeatedly tweeted and retweeted abusive and hateful content. The first being an account called at Devin Nunes's mom. <laughs> wow. That's cold. That is cold. That's John. cold. That is ice cold. That's embarrassing man. seeing a parody account of your mom. <laughs> but even more embarrassing is seeing it how it looks when written out in a formal lawsuit. Because the suit says, and I quote, in her endless barrage of tweets, Devin Nunez's mom maliciously attacked every aspect of Nunez's character. Yes, it, it is Friday in the wake of Devin Nunez's mom and his cow. It is March 22nd, 2019. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out the Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. On today's show, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern moves to ban all assault rifles and automatic or semi automatic weapons. Just like that, the gods of Vulcan and Moloch are thrown back to the underworld. An egg boy. Egg boy becomes global hero for egging fascist Australian politician Fraser Anning. And predictably, liberal guardians of civility decide to discipline egg boy and both sides the issue. Wisconsin Republicans plan to strip power from incoming Democratic governor he shot down as unconstitutional that's a win and the flooding in Nebraska, Missouri and Iowa in the aftermath of the latest bomb cyclone should be shaking us awake about our climate future we have less than 12 years now folks Democratic presidential hopeful former Colorado Governor John Hickenlooper makes his primetime campaign debut by telling the world about the time he went to go see Deep Throat with his mom (laughs) You can't make this up. <laughs> but then, realizing, making a little bit of mistake, goes in for recovery mode and asks why women candidates aren't asked if they plan on choosing a male running mate. <laughs> it's a double boom, boom, right there. Bernie's campaign makes history as campaign staffers form a union. Whoop. And Bernie goes public with his support for the union and uses that moment to advocate for unionization across the country. Some union leaders from the FLCIO come out hard against the Green New Deal and right wing and corporate media eat it up. Meanwhile, PA Auditor General Eugene DePasquale hosted a public hearing at Penn State's campus with Michael Mann on the impacts of climate change on the state. Pasquale said, quote, every time there's a disaster in Pennsylvania, it's a hit to the state's taxpayers, as opposed as opposed to if we were to do something beforehand to mitigate this. Imagine that. Do something ahead of time to mitigate that. There's this a, thing called the Green New Deal. There you go. A report will be forthcoming. Uh, speaking of moms today, Devin Nunez is not happy with his Twitter mom, <laughs> so he's going to sue her, as you heard. <laughs> And her cow. Apparently, when Devin Nunez's cow tweeted, quote, Devin's boots are full of manure. He's utterly worthless, and it's pasture time to move him to prison. That was just too much. The foo-foos were heard, and Devin seeking the safe space. And Beto O'Rourke brings in some big fundraising numbers at $6.1 million. He's a little vague on the details, though. At least he's consistent in his vagary. Today's PA Focus, Pennsylvania House Republicans failed at fast-tracking an anti-union bill through the chamber this week. And it was a call for a roll call vote that killed it, at least for now. SEIU Healthcare PA, PA SNAP, and the Coalition of Nurses were in the Capitol on Wednesday to lobby for safe patient ratios in hospitals across the state. Freaking A, awesome. PA SNAP folks, those nurses, man, those people are great. 
And the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center held its annual budget summit this week. Sean was there. He's going to give us the lowdown. And in today's last call, Beer and Space News, well, the Vice President's baby, the National Space Council, will be pushing hard to make the June 2020 launch date to return humans to the moon. Better bring the Preparation H, because NASA researchers found that the longer the astronauts spend in space, the more likely they are to reactivate them herpes. Ouch! Galactic capitalists, though, are getting really excited about turning the eighth continent, as they call it, the moon, into a mining and rocket fuel operation. For real. They're pushing this for real now. And Toyota is getting tapped by Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency to develop a big-ass off-road lunar rover. The thing is really cool, at least the uh, the initial drawings of it. Pretty freaking amazing. As expected... Boeing is delaying a test launch of its crew capsule from April until this August. I wonder if that has every, anything to do with its freaking 737s that are t- being, taking dives out of the sky. And known millennial hater Mark Price is popping up in some odd places doing some pithy subtweeting. Got more on that. Sean's made it to week two with no beer. That's big. So he's probably not going to be at free will this weekend. <laughs> But in case you want to, Free Will is hosting the March Meltdown 5K from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on Sunday. Meltdown begins and ends at Free Will Brewing, and at the 5K race it takes place on the scenic trails in and around Perkasy and along the east branch of the Perky Omen Creek. And you guess what? You get a nice little coupon to get yourself a beer. Free Will will also release Holographic Universe tomorrow. And that's going to have both those cation. That's a sour ale. This sounds really good. A sour ale with boysenberry plum, sweet basil, and milk sugar. It's available in cans on, and on draft beginning tomorrow. That's Saturday the 23rd. Want to remind everybody to tune in the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org. Also, you know, while you're at it, you make sure you download Rick's daily podcast on iTunes, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just look them up at Rick Smith Show. I want to thank all of our members this week, and also we got some members uh, that have rejoined us, have come back on and support. I want to really, appre- I really appreciate it. Um, in some cases, uh, we had a couple members who were having some issues with Patreon. If you are a member and you had some issues with Patreon and the card being on the update, let me know. We'll get it worked out. So I appreciate those folks who have who have come back into the fold, and we're going to need to make a big push moving forward. So look. You want a progressive future? We need a progressive media. You can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. And I can tell you right now, if you want to come in at the $10 a month level, you come in, you're a new member coming in at the $10 a month level, I will send you David Wallace's Wells new book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. It is the kind of thing that uh, will shock you into action if you are not already engaged. Um, I highly recommend the book. That's David Wallace Wells, The Uninhabitable Earth. And if you join us today um, or anytime in the next month, right, to the end of April we'll give you, uh, go to patreon.com and become a member at the $10 a month level. I'll send you that book. So there we have it. The only way to support this is moving forward. So Sean, man, it's been uh, it's been quite a week. A lot of stuff. Go- it's been a, it's been a kind of a, uh, in some ways. It's I, been quite a moving week. It's been a very moving. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, like, do we actually know if Devin Nunes' mom <laughs> is a female, or is this like a gender neutral Twitter account? Well, the, the, it's been actually. I mean, it has been um, um, deactivated. Right. Um, the his the, the, the Kevin Nunez, his mom has uh, De, uh, Devin Nunez, his mom has Devin Nunez's cow is now kind of like he's got more Twitter followers than Devin Nunez does. <laughs> right. So that one shot up. Um, what I'm unclear at this point, there's also a, uh, a libertarian uh, think tank or organization consultancy group or something like this that is uh, um, is also named in the lawsuit. And I'm not sure if that is um, was was came out of that organization or not. Um, the woman who runs that uh, think tank or consultancy group, 
um, was not wanting to talk very openly on it. But she was actually on like NPR and stuff talking about um, about uh, this legal case. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting when you get the kind of like two sections of the right wing <laughs> kind of going at each other. Uh, that's always kind of interesting. So uh, it's it's unclear. But that's how it's playing out. But it's literally, if you read the lawsuit, we should this. <clears throat> go ahead. No, I was gonna say, if you read the lawsuit, you actually see the named parties in the lawsuit are like Devin Nunez's mom and Devin Nunez's cow. You see, like this is where we need, like I guess it's common law from England, right? Is this, that, is that what it is that forces like? It's really hard to file frivolous lawsuits in, in England, right, yeah. for the way their law system is set up because you actually have to pay for the court cost if your lawsuit's deemed a frivolous lawsuit. Right. I really wish we would take that up here in the United States. So, like, people like Devin Nunes can't use the court system as, a like, just a tool to attack, you know, detractors and people, you know, speaking on social media. Well, yeah. I mean, look. It's sort of like Dan Leach calling Dan Leach a, ra- a rapist. Well, here, here, but here's the here's the well the, here's where it's different, right? Here's where it's different. It's like where with, with Devin Nunez's case, right? When he went and he was explaining on Fox News about what exactly this lawsuit was about, he basically said this is the first of many lawsuits, right? So on, on the surface, right? Well, this, you also think about it, like is this coming from Clarence Thomas? What Clarence Thomas said a few weeks ago, where Thomas. I think in a recent opinion or stated somewhere where he wants to go after first amendment protections around slander and libel and make it easier for public officials or richer people to file slander or libel suits in wake of the me too movement and stuff like that. Well, I think, I think it's actually a bigger, a bigger game than that. I think that's part of it. Right. I think that part. So look, I think the frame goes like this, right. As you know, on the right wing media, right. What's big right now is talking about how all the right wing is being, Twitter. Right, is being deplatformed and the conspiracy theory about say Twitter and Facebook and everything are using their algorithms to purposely allow criticism against conservatives and stifle conservative speech or right wing speech in particular, while allowing liberals off, off the hook. That's the, the kind of the logic of that conspiracy theory on the right. So, but what but they don't have, but they're not guaranteed the free speech because this is these are private companies in a private forum. <clears throat> well, that's that's where look. your constitutional right isn't guaranteed because they have fought hard to protect these monopolies in forming and therefore deciding whichever way they want to operate. But as look, a this, this is where, but this is where it's an interesting. This is where it gets interesting, right? Is that because look? Antitrust suits, right? That have been like if this is about free market capitalism, then like Devin Nunes would be all for breaking. You know they don't believe that, right? You know these people don't believe this stuff. All they are is about power grabbing, right? They use that's their rhetoric. That's the rhetoric they use to convince the rest of us that we should just freaking work hard and give all our money to the corporations. That's their bullshit rhetoric. They don't even they don't believe it for for a second. Right. Except, you know, the libertarians on the far right, like those libertarians, people, they believe it because they believe they're going to be on the winning side of stuff. They can take all the shit. But with someone like Devin Nunez, the vast majority of the Republican Party, it's about power. It's not about they don't believe any of those things. So the thing is, is that what's at stake here in my mind is is twofold, because one it, there's been movements in the antitrust direction when it comes to th- places like Twitter and Facebook and so on. Which and, Elizabeth Warren has been really big at pushing exactly. her in her campaign. Exactly, right? And if you look at what Elizabeth Warren's, like the way that she's come at it, right, is that, you know, the big question right now is that are these, to a certain degree, public spaces, right? Are the things there, does a company get to, get to control all of that data or do you have the right to kind of engage in this space you know, without being kind of interfered by these companies, right? So, I mean, that's that's one angle of it. There's a bunch of other stuff too as well. But so part of it is, is that you see Nunez's lawsuit is also kind of piggybacking off that kind of language about how Twitter is dominating that. Now, their angle of it is that it's a, it's a political, like, you know, stifling of, of conservative speech, right? They're looking at it through that lens as opposed to, you know, what Elizabeth Warren is coming at it in terms of, like, the accumulation of profit of the company. So w- what's happening, though, is that... It, what ha- you know, Twitter now has to pony up, right? Because the, the lawsuit is for like what twenty five million dollars or something like this, mm-hmm. and so Twitter's going to have to pony up and 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 kind of lawyer up on this one, right? And so they're going to have to decide: Are we going to fight this tooth and nail, 
right? Um, are we going to fight it and demand that, that he's wrong to shoot it down? Or are they going to try to have some sort of plea bargain, which is going to gradually wither away kind of political discourse in those spaces, right? Because once you start whittling away political discourse on this, that becomes tricky. Because what I don't the think criti- this is like normalizing. I feel like this is a way for normalizing hate speech as conservative speech. Well, it, it might be, right? I mean, because it's like you think about like the main people, culprits behind this have been white nationalists. Exactly racists and other people who have been deemed for making hate speech and you way you look at it, like they're trying to frame this as an attack against conservative speech which is trying to normalize white supremacy and normalize racism and stuff like that right so, so I, mean, I think I, I mean like, I think that there's two things going on here though I think that on the one hand you've got a, a an agenda they're testing out an agenda which is very similar to what happened with Gawker Right. They're going to test it out to see if they can just file these lawsuits and file these lawsuits and pressure Twitter into making changes that will be more inviting to the kind of the, the right wing. Right. That's one side of it. Or to, and to try to put out a business, some of these kind of kind of these other organizations. So to what degree, how much money is going to be behind this? That's going to be very interesting to see. On the other hand, in the discovery process, if this goes to court, right, it's a, in the discovery process, right, Nunez's lawyers are going to be asking for Twitter's algorithms. Right. And because their claim is, is that the algorithms of Twitter and Facebook and these other social media platforms are 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 consciously biased against conservatives, and they seem to even be suggesting that they, Twitter might be producing bots to go after them, right? And the only way you can prove that is actually to see the algorithm. Now, Devin Nunez has been like notorious for being the guy who's taking <laughs> stuff from confidential hearings and running over to the White House to show them what's going on. So what happens when that algorithm is kind of, if, if Twitter is forced to hand over that algorithm, and then Nunez is able to pass that out to his, to his kind of right-wing buddies, they can game the algorithm ahead of the 2020 election. That's freaking huge. And not just the election, but in terms of kind of like changing consciousness, right? That's, in my mind, that's the deep area. Where they're trying to steal the logarithms to game it. Right, exactly. Because then they'll have the, they'll have the, the tools by which they'll, they'll know how to game that system. But then can't Twitter come around and just change the logarithms again? Sure. Which I mean, yeah, I mean, and, which, I'm, and I'm sure they will, but you think about the cost in that, right? So again, it's, it's just they're trying to cost it to, uh, to Twitter. Right. I mean, yeah. of course, Twitter's going to like, you know, if you want to hang out of like redoing logarithms is not going to be that much money. I don't think compared to what the company's making profit wise. Right. But OK, look, but if then if you're but in it, court, it still puts time, energy and effort into doing that. If, right. If you're, you're in court, the next thing you do. So Twitter redo, redo, redoes the um, the algorithm. OK, we need to see that. We need to see the new one. Right. If you're saying that you've made adjustments, we need to see that to prove it. We just can't take your word for it. I mean, if I was the lawyer for that, that's what I would be asking for. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so this is this is deeply problematic. So on the one hand, like I want to send an email to Devin Nunez and like, you know, listen, I disagree with virtually everything you do. But thank you for this, because I've been laughing harder this week than I have in a long, long time because you've like you're suing Devin Nunez's mom. But on the other hand, there's a seriousness to this um, to this as well, which we can't lose sight of because this could be deeply problematic. Yeah. So so we'll see. We'll see. You know, and at the very least that, you know, that, you know, Devin Nunez as a kind of public official, former public official, elected official, things like this, like he doesn't get like protections in that way. People can say really mean things to him, <laughs> right? Because because that is protected as First Amendment speech. The tricky part is that it is taking place within a private forum, quote unquote, private forum, at least privately owned space. Um, so how that's going to get played out, right? My guess is like, look, if I were on the right wing right now and I've got the kind of courts, the courts that I've had that we know that Mitch McConnell has been burning through court appointments to get him up there, that's what I would want to be doing. I would want to try to be making like to kind of privatize as much the as bench. possible. What's that? Let legislate from the bench. Yeah, right. I mean that that's what they're after. That's why McConnell's been pushing so far. When why we get so pissed off at Chuck Schumer when Chuck's like, ah, we'll make you a deal. We'll give you seventeen judges so we can go home. Right? That's that's a problem. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> Meanwhile, back on the planet of reality, <laughs> uh we got in 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 the wake of the horrible uh mass shooting, fifty dead in New Zealand, uh Prime Minister uh Jacinda Ardern this week announces they're banning it all. 
they're banning assault rifles or assault weapons. They're banning semi-automatic or automatic weapons. Any add-ons to guns that will make them perform in that way, like those bump stocks, right across the board. Right? Um, and I'm like, holy cow. What does it look like to, to, to look at this from a different perspective, a different world, and a different political di- discourse when it comes to guns? But also, there you I go. mean... This happened back in Australia 30 years ago with exactly. the Port Arthur shooting. And it's like, I mean, the Port Arthur shooting shows how things happen after you have strong gun laws that come in place. Yep. Gun crimes go down. Right, exactly. Um, like, yeah. And not only that, gun crimes, but suicides. I mean, yesterday I was listening to Deep Pasquale speak. You know, he's taking on, one of the things he's doing is trying to take on gun crime. And in the state and like, you know, two thirds of all gun related deaths in Pennsylvania and probably throughout the country are self inflicted gunshot wounds. Yep. Like, yeah. But um in response, also one of the good responses, Egg Boy. Egg Boy That was brilliant, man. That was brilliant. Uh Egg Boy, like yeah, seventeen year old seventeen year old kid, man. Uh, knows exactly what he's doing, right? The guy's name is... Uh, knows uh, exactly what's going to happen afterwards, too. Yep. I mean... So if anybody hasn't if anybody hasn't seen this, right, this, there's this kid, his 17-year-old, his name is William Connolly, better known as Egg Boy. Um, there was uh, this Australian senator um, uh, by the name of Fraser Anning, who's been known, far-right figure, like extreme views on immigration, known to hang out with fascists. Right, um, is giving this press conference after he's basically said that the reason, like the, the 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 person to blame, the people to blame for that mass shooting are the Muslims who immigrated to New Zealand and New Zealand for allowing them to come. You got the seventeen year old kid holds up his cell phone, right, um, to to this kind of Fraser Anning as he's being interviewed on on live TV and smashes an egg in the back of his head, <laughs> and you can <could> hear it. <laughs> And then and, Anning proceeds to punch him in the face and his goons bring him to the floor and put him in a chokehold, which I am sure that this kid knew exactly what was going to happen. <laughs> yes. And egging people in Australian and English politics is a tried and true tradition. <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> I mean, like, let's, let's be real here. Uh, that This is a tradition of political discourse in England and in Australia, egging people and Frankly, it should be more used more widely, I think. Yeah, I'm telling I you. I mean, the response... I mean, you made this guy look like a fucking asshole to begin with, with the egging. I mean, that's pretty much the point of, like, egging someone. <laughs> it, like, And the response he gave, I gave him, like, an open hand slap on the side of the head. I mean, I didn't really see... Look at it. I didn't, I didn't see him, like... I, I don't see... I didn't see, like, a punch. No, it was, it was more of a, like, yeah, yeah. A, like, like, an open hand, like palm to the face and all that but he knew what was going to happen after that like i mean he took two swings at the kid hit swing at a 17 year old probably not the best thing optically to do having your goon is be up a 17 year old also not the best thing to do um but you know like afterwards uh he's gotten a lot of praise for what he did yep you want to know why the people who praised him tell me who bring this back to the local ben simmons from the philadelphia 76ers Oh, uh, Simmons. Simmons is an Australian basketball player, probably like one of the best players in the world at this point, behind James and a few others. But uh, Simmons is a 22, 23 year old, very young, and he wrote Egg Boy on his sneakers That's for the past awesome. couple of games. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and someone tweeted at him, Would you do that if that was your father? He, Simmons said, if my father said something that fucking stupid, I'd yes, egg him I myself. <laughs> <laughs> Shut down that conversation real quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's like, well, I mean, look, and this is it, you know. And again, you saw, you saw. But as, that's like that—that's their discourse in England, and it's not. Yeah, no, that—that's where we should put civility aside. And yeah, there are other means of speech besides doing things in a civil manner. 
Well, but look at this. Like I, I look at it like this. So the the question is, this guy is you know what dro- drove me crazy this week is in the aftermath of seeing like again the Guardians of Civility come out and like wow that was really inappropriate that the kid you know like I agree with you know again this is anytime you hear this language right know what's going on when you hear somebody say I agree with his sentiments but I disagree with how he went about it every time you hear that. Right. Then, you know, you basically have an apologist like for the status quo on your hands. That's what's going on. Right. They want things to remain the same, even though if you push them out, it's like, no, I care so much. We just need to be civil. We can't. I Bullshit. agree with the sentiment, but we shouldn't really impede on the Nazis marching into our neighborhood. Exactly. Exactly. I agree that these people are bad. I mean, like, yeah, these are the people who you'll be sitting next to in the fucking firing squads. No, that's right. And, and you know, see, I told you. <laughs> yep. You know, I wrote this piece. I've talked about this before for this book uh, on really rhetorics, right? Um, it's a it's a collection of essays talking about disruptive rhetorics, direct, disruptive stuff. And one of the arguments that I make in that is exactly this, is that you want civility re- requires a playing field that people agree that discourse and disagreement and argument are going to be contained within that space of debate, right? And they're going to play by the rules within the bounds of like, the rules. At- Fraser Anning's rhetoric is not civil in any way. No, it's and it, very violent. It 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 is. It puts people of color. It puts Muslims. It puts Aborigines, you know, Indigenous people in Australia, at risk for more violence by blaming the immigrants and by blaming the Muslims for their own mass for the mass killing that happened to them. Exactly. And yeah, you know what? Like that perpetuates violence even more. Right. Egging someone not really perpetuating violence. No, and this is, you know, this is where Sam Cedar, the majority report this week, he was dead on about this. It's like, the thing is, is that what, you cannot look at this act outside context, right? The thing is, is that these people feel that they have the, they've been given the green light. Like this kid who went and, and, and the young kid, who based young guy who killed those um, Muslim worshipers, right? The 50 people that he killed and the other, whatever, 48 that are, that are wounded, Right. He did that. And he cited Donald Trump as an inspiration. And he cited Charlie Kirk and he cited Candace Owens. Exactly. He cited these grifters that the Republican Party have been have wed themselves to. Exactly. Because they feel that they are kind of like given a space and have a certain legitimacy to come out and kind of speak about this stuff here. If we want to kind of do we have to like the the bounds of democracy, the bounds of civility require that people like that do not get admission. And do not feel that they are just just like everybody else. And what this does, and what Sam Cedar was saying, is I think is dead on. Is that look what that egging does is it lets those people know, right? It wasn't he wasn't like he went up and he punched the guy, right? Although we could talk about that too. But it's like it wasn't that that he did it. He egged the guy, and yes, it was uncivil, right? But the but the message was that we see you, and we will not tolerate this. Right. Yeah. You, and then, you and then are Fraser not was allowed confronted. in this discourse. And then after this happened, Fraser Anning was chased down and exactly. confronted in an airport over the same stuff by Muslim men. Exactly. Now, and I bet you there are going to be people around Fraser Anning with eggs in their pocket now. Right. And that guy is going to know. So before he starts kind of rattling off all his crap, this is what's going to happen. And this is where the New Zealand and every prime time minister he's in public now, he's become a pariah. Yes. And that's what egging does to him. That, that's what exactly. It's, it's it right. turned him into an instant pariah. Right. And so, you know, you have, you have two. This is like the lesson for politics here is like the, the twofold one is like one, you've got the egg boy coming out and basically saying, no, that's it. You don't get this platform. Yes. Deplatforming the fascist. Yes. Right. It works. So there you go. And then at the same, so that's a decisive move, right, about what we consider as the border of civility. Right. And that's it. And once you cross that, there we go. We're going to we're going to say you do not belong here. And then on the other end of things, you have a decisive decision made by um, by Prime Minister uh, Jacinda Ardern. In, in, in New Zealand, not these half measures. Well, we're going to look into we're going to study this. No. Boom. We're going to ban this crap. Why? Because it works. How do we know that? Australia did exactly the same thing. Uh, they stopped having these mass shootings anymore. That's what we're going to do. Enough is enough. Boom, we're doing this. Right? And let the let the arguments come. Right? So, I mean, two bold, decisive moves. Right? And that is what you see progressive. You know, and I've, I've looked into her record. I've looked into her background. She's freaking phenomenal. 
mm-hmm. right? As a progressive politician, like she's like the second youngest, I think, like this, um, um, uh, um, a prime minister in the, in, in the world, the second youngest woman. I'm not sure how it goes. Um, she's like the second woman who's ever given birth while she is um, kind of a serving president or prime minister. I mean, and her, her record is phenomenal. Right. She ran overtly on a progressive thing and she's going to making good on this. This should be the lesson. Right. That progressives take from this country. I mean, because like that woman is amazing. The fact that when what did she do when like when you had this, you know, in the aftermath, she went and she spent time with these people who were victims. She didn't sit there, try to court the gun lobby on Twitter. She was there with those people. And she stood behind them and not just in words, not just in kind of like, you know, thoughts and prayers, but in action, decisive political action. Bravo. Bravo, Egg Boy. Bravo, Jacinda Ardern. Awesome. A quick note in Wisconsin as we bring take uh, put the cheese on the egg. Uh, we have the uh, Wisconsin very, very cool news this week that uh, Republicans tried to uh, pass a, you know, uh, a lame duck uh, during a lame duck session after they lost the governorship after Scott Walker was sent packing. Um, they tried to pass a bunch of uh, rules that would basically strip the governor of any powers, the same powers that Scott um, that uh, Scott Walker had used. I almost said Scott Wagner. Scott Walker had used to um, um, to to you know institute horrible anti labor policies, anti women policies, all that kind of stuff. Um, the uh, uh, a court in Wisconsin has found that to be unconstitutional, so that is not going to be going forward, which is awesome. I'm sure it's going to be appealed, but this is a major win. That's awesome. Um, and. Uh, I don't want to get too far into this today, um, but the, um, you know, if you look at the flooding, the flooding is taking place in the center of this country. There's a bomb, a bomb freaking cyclone, right? We had one on towards the East Coast earlier on in the year where the bomb cyclone is basically the pressure drops so fast that it produces these like, like gale force winds and everything like this. There was like basically winds the equivalent of a hurricane, like a, 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 what it's a, a level two, right? Hurricane. Um, in the middle of the country, right? Um, and that is precisely because there is so much energy in the atmosphere, water in the atmosphere. Um, it produced this. And the, you had the massive, like, blizzard conditions on one side of the storm, like torrential downpour rains on the other side of the storm. And then in the aftermath of that flooding from the rains, the snowpack melts, again, flooding rivers again. And so you've got, like, I mean, some of the pictures from Nebraska are just unbelievable, they're like you're talking like as far as the eye can see everything is underwater and those farmers are going to be virtually devastated by that and this has everything to do we should be holding that in our head like again i'm going to plug david wallace wells book go read that shit because what you see having here in uh nebraska and missouri and iowa is going to be increasingly the norm and i'll give you an idea is that not only are we going to sacrifice huge sections of our farmland in this country but as much as one third right in like you know in some cases depending between the mid and the end of the century would be one third of the whole earth would be inhabitable Right. Simply because of that, it'll be too hot for human beings to exist without cooking in their own skins because they can't get rid of the heat. Crap like that. We're going to have to start holding on to these images of disaster. And instead of thinking about it as like, oh, all bets are off. We got to use that as for decisive action. We got to move protect for the green jobs deal. first. What's that? Do we have to protect the jobs first? <sighs> Dude. <laughs> Look, all I'm going to say is this, like for now, because I think, like, I, I like, I, I seriously, I want to have, I want to have at some point, like, an entire program, or maybe actually bringing some, um, some people to talk about this stuff, um, because it's, it's last week, right before our show, um, we saw the, like, the announcement that was coming out from, not the entire AFL CIO, although that's how it's getting ran, um, kind of run through on, on right wing media. Um, not the entire AFL CIO, but um, but a certain segment of union leaders in there that came forward and come out Conservative against building trades, building trades, the, uh, uh, the pipe fitters union, the uh, uh, you know the miners. I mean, all this kind of stuff. Basically, they're saying that against against Green New Deal because we got to protect the jobs. Now, here's the thing. First of all, I want everybody like seriously. I'll link it again in today's show if you want. Um, we got to read the Green New Deal because basically what, it, what Green New Deal says is that we're not going to let those workers just kind of like like you know die and try to make it off on their own. What Democrats have done in the past, 
right? They talk about transition to different kind of energy. And then what they've done in the past is like, hey, we'll give you job training. We'll give you some more education in the hopes that maybe you'll find another job. That is unrealistic, which is why the Green New Deal basically says, look, yeah, those opportunities can be provided for somebody who's young enough in their career or they want to move forward. But basically what we're going to have to do in order to make this transition is we're going to basically have to buy out their contracts. And we're going to shut industries down. Like we need to have a long, thoughtful conversation about this. Coal industry, it's going to have to go. Gas industry, that's going to have to go. And people like need to come to grips with like these industries are going to have to go. And the jobs that are with them will have to be transferred to someone else or contracts will be bought out because there are no jobs on a burnt planet. No, that's absolutely right. And I, I, I mean, plead. Like, I ple- or, I mean, I think the job or, yeah, like there will be no union jobs on a burnt planet. Right. Or, you're, 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 or you're, yeah, you go home to a place that you can barely live on. I mean, Sean, what blew my mind in this, like, again, and I, I hate that I kind of keep on, like, like running into this, like the Uninhabitable Earth and uh, David Wallace Wells' book. Um, he's basically talking about just from like air pollution alone, if we do nothing, right? If we do nothing, it's, there's going to be like, like in, I think it's by 2050, 2050, the equivalent of, uh, what was it? I, I'm going to get the number wrong now, but it's like the equivalent of like 10 or 12 holocausts of people that will be killed just from air pollution alone, right? And I hate to make that comparison, but that's a comparison he makes in the book as a way to kind of drive this stuff home, right? We're talking about like the loss of lives, right? And, and not to mention when you and start, we're, seeing that, we're starting to see that stuff here in Pennsylvania with what's happening with the Coke plant in Pittsburgh, what's happening here in central Pennsylvania with the unfettered expansion of warehousing, the warehouse and trucking industry, like some of the worst air quality in the state is right here in central Pennsylvania, like because of the unchecked like uh you know expansion of the trucking industry out here and the warehouse industry and stuff like that like like these are things that people we're gonna have to start weighing seriously my right to have a healthy life outweighs someone having a job no, but, I, but look, I, I disagree with that formulation. I believe that it's this, right? I, it's not, this does not, if we have the political organization and will, this is not, and this is not a kind of like, you know, uh, um, um, like win-lose scenario. This is not an either-or scenario. It is not the kind of like, you know, um, someone then has to, you're just going to have to suck it up and be out of your job. No. The thing is, politi- this is what I would plead to my union brothers and sisters, right? Is that, look, we have an opportunity now because the crisis is so real and pressing, right? When the IPCC released its report, like back in October, they said we have 12 years to make major transformations in our economy to avoid a dystopian future, basically. 12 years. That's less than 12 years now, right? I was looking at the Sunrise Movement. Sunrise Movement had these these t-shirts, right? That says 12 years on it. And I wanted to buy that shirt. I'm like, it's less than 12 years now. The shirt is already out of date. Yeah. The point is this, is that if we have we have to make the case that we need massive investments in alternative infrastructure and those should be union jobs, that is the Green New Deal. And what the union, what my brothers and sisters in the union movement, what we need to be doing, we need to be ensuring that that is the case moving forward, right? It is not the specific job that is important. It's the jobs that are going to lead to sustainable futures. It's making sure the working class in this country is going to be protected. And by increasing and continuing on the coal and fossil fuel path, we are basically subjecting to death a big section of the working class in this country because we know it's the most vulnerable communities that are going to be hit the worst. And to ask our members, to ask the working class to be part and parcel and complicit in their own children's deaths is disgusting. And that's why we have to be, in um, one, union members need to be actively involved in this stuff. We need to get past the identity politics that our identity as a specific kind of worker is what's matter. What matters is that we are going to ha- inherit, give to our children and grandchildren, right, a sustainable future, a livable future. And that means, yes, unions need to be all in in supporting and helping craft this. This is what they did up in Canada with the LEAP Manifesto. 
you had all these people in. And then, yes, I know that some people are pissed off that, that they feel that the unions were not ad- adequately consulted in terms of crafting of that. I get that, right? I get that. But now, instead of it being the stick in the mud on this one, we got to be active in the process, insisting that we're at the table crafting that stuff and crafting in such a way to make sure we have a new working class future. Right? One in which nobody is getting left behind because we know the extractive industries have done nothing but leave people behind. They've left people dead in hospitals with black lung disease. They left whole communities devastated as soon as that stuff was out of the ground. That can no longer happen. And we have an opportunity to turn that back like no other time in history because the crisis is so real and so present. So I said I wasn't going to talk about it. Here I am talking about it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. But, okay. Anyways, so that's the big deal. That's the big deal this week. Um, On the union front, huge deal, right? Bernie's campaign, the staffers formed a union. That is so awesome. And like, and like the boss that we wish there were bosses out there like that, instead of kind of being anti-union and fighting it, Bernie Sanders goes out and supports the, the unionization of his own campaign. Right? And that's going to put a tremendous amount of pressure upon those other campaigns to do, to, to do exactly the same. I'm waiting, yeah. to see, I'm waiting to see which is going to be the first campaign that we have the, the staffers to try to unionize and, uh, and the candidate They're tries to be out. a union buster. Yeah. Uh, I think Beto. Would be a good choice. Well, yeah, that that would be consistent with his voting record, <laughs> right? Yeah, whole lot of men in I'm, there. Well, yeah, totally. Well, you know, he did. He pulled in six point one million dollars this well, week. He knows how to speak. Well, and so, what we really need is some more hope and change. Well, yeah, but without you know, look, look at least Obama had had, had kind of had convictions, a had policy positions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I didn't agree with a bunch of those positions, but I mean, Obama was, you know, he had the positions. I, I like the way they put it on SNL, right? Saturday Night Live, they basically, uh, you know, basically he's got all the energy of a golden retriever pup. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what it was. It's like, all the energy, want to be enthusiasm, and they're going to run a campaign just on kind of sheer enthusiasm. I hear like you get like three extra votes for every time you stand up on a countertop. I think that's true, right? Right. Well, did you hear that uh, the phrase coming out this week? Why stand up for something when you can stand on something? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I have to say, you know, I, I, I seeing the campaign against Ted Cruz, right? I, I was like, wow, this guy is this guy has got he's got oh, yeah, something. No one looked at his record and his scrutiny, right? Because you're going against Ted he's Cruz in Texas, right? In Texas and Ted Cruz, right? But the more I learn about his record, the more I'm like, whoa. This this guy is it's 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 not just that he's it's like he's empty and his like it's more about performing like bipartisanship and voting with the Republicans than it is anything else. Um, that that's not good. That is not the direction that we go. So I I mean you know whatever. And I'm really curious because there was you know if you look at his filings for the um the six point one million dollars, he says there's there's like I can't remember how many thousands of unique contributions right whereas bernie sanders when it announced it says like how many thousands of unique individuals those are different yeah. things right because you can max out on your thing so basically i can be i could make you know whatever 20 unique donations to a campaign to get to myself to the point where i'm maxing out on it yeah right and and i have no idea if that's what's going on but we're going to see when those finances are going to be released so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a lot of people maxed out there. Well, I'm curious where the where the money's coming are, from. It seems like a lot of suckers are falling for Beto. Yeah, well, he makes people feel good. And that's why. Yeah, and I think, look, I understand that. I, I get it. You know, um, I, I know watching him campaign against Fred, Ted Cruz made me feel good, right? Um, but that feel good, you know, I'd rather be able to kind of – you know, have, you know, universal Medicare so I can feel good all the time, not just when I'm watching him on a campaign trail. It'll be good to see what uh, Bernie supporters here in Pennsylvania switch over to Beto in the outcome of 2020 election. Yeah, that's going to be really, really interesting. That's going to be interesting. I'm going to I'm going to wonder what's going to happen with, uh, you know, when those endorsements start coming in from statewide. We'll see. Well, who's, you know, we're going to watch Rendell. Right, because we say where like where Rendell is going to kind of exert his influence because he's the one who still has a disproportionate weight in terms of the campaign, right? We're going to find out what happens with Wolf and find out what happens with Fetterman, 
And, uh, you know, are they going to kind of like, you know, kind of try to tap a candidate early on and get behind them? Or are they going to let the primary press process uh, play out? I mean, I- I've said this before. I'm a big fan of letting the, the primary process uh, uh, play out. Um, I think that is going to be absolutely important. Right. So before, you know, start getting the kind of like Twitter battles over this crap, it's like I want to see I want to see the actual like debates. I want to see these candidates kind of working with each other because that's going to be really determinant. So, well, you know, what's really going to work this year. I heard. Tell me. Uh, picking your vice president presidential candidate mm. uh, when you announce your candidacy. Yeah. Or when you kind of announce your candidacy. Like like, um, you know, pull Scott Wagner. Yeah, so I wonder who would do something like that. Well, let me see. Who else has yet to announce their candidacy? I, I, I'm you're stumping me, Sean. Yeah, some old guy. Some old guy. But, oh yeah, okay. yeah, Uncle Joe. Yeah, <laughs> it, it amazes me how like this, like the support around Trump or Biden. Yeah, is like the definition of insanity. Doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results, which like that might actually win this year in 2020, <laughs> like picking the establishment candidate, but because of how bad Trump is, and like that's their bank again, yeah, like that's what they're banking on. But like, all Biden is is like Kool Aid for the white working the white working class Democrats who. As we read in that New York Times article a couple weeks ago about Frank Scavo, who built this party, think that they're still in control of the party, and that's who's exerting force with, with Biden. Yep. When, as we talked about here with the New American Majority, like, white working people are only, like, one leg of that, like, four-legged stool. Yep. Like, they don't carry much weight anymore in, in, in the Democratic Party. And really, the, the constituency that Biden has within the Democratic Party is your old white people who are pretty much like the Fox News viewers of the Democratic Party. And by that, I mean their demographic is dead and dying. Yeah, I think that's right. I don't know anyone under 60 who is excited about Biden running for president. Well, I know a few people, but they are more of your political operative establishment Democratic types. Right. But really, like, there's no, the main populace is not really like Biden's constituency. No, and like I said, like you know, what for me, what's going to happen in the primary? You know, in some in some ways, it's a shame that he's gonna he's gonna do this because, you know, what's going to be front and center then is everything that happened with with uh, Anita Hill in my mind is like you know. I think try to whitewash his record. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's like from the super from uh, the crime bill to the student loan debt bills, uh, the debt bills back in the two thousands that he's been pushing for all these years. Um, like, I'm really looking forward to not. Biden and Bernie going at it. I'm really looking forward to Biden and Warren going at it because there's a lot more animus between them two than between Bernie and, Bernie and Biden. Yeah, that's right. And like Warren's been going after Biden on his horrible fucking records on this debt issue for two decades now. Yeah. Like, and she's not going to let him walk away with that. No, especially because look, because like for her, especially, I mean, especially he was one Warren. of the main drivers to shackle students in this like yeah. lifelong uh, debt. That's payment. right. That's right. And that's going to matter, right? And that's going to resonate with huge sections. So the but real question is, what millennials have to say? Yeah. Well, this is real. Okay. <laughs> did, did you read um, this week? See, I didn't even put this on here because I wasn't going to talk about it. But there was. Um, there was this piece that came out um, about kind of the um, oh, shoot, I'm not gonna be able to find it. Basically, like the standing down of the hashtag resistance. Right? No, I didn't see this. So, Wait, you mean like the resistance is folding like a wet paper towel and? Yes. Right. Like so <laughs> here it is. So it's by. Um, I'm just. I'm spacing his name. Uh, oh yeah, it's like Matthew Iglesias, right? So he's writing about um, writing about the uh, the demobilization of the resistance is a dangerous mistake. That's the title of the piece in Vox, right? Um, and w- what's interesting there is that because and 
there's a bunch of stuff in there. I'm not going to go through it all, but there's the one kind of key aspect of this is that there's a tendency, especially with the kind of the center of the Democratic Party, is that once someone like from the party gets in charge, like Nancy Pelosi, for example, like the, the tendency to kind of hand over authority back to those people. Right. Just what we saw with with Obama, Obama gets elected. He's going to handle it. Now I can go back and kind of, you know, drink my lattes and kind of, you know, um, I'm going to go out to brunch again. Thank God. And all that kind of stuff. Right. It's this kind of return to a more normalized middle class, upper middle class kind of way of being. And I think that's part of what's happening right now. Right. It's and, you know, part of what there's a bunch of other stuff there just about the sheer like exhaustion that so many, especially of the kind of the younger groups of folks that are moving forward, because I, I want to be clear here. And I don't mean that, that, that everyone has demobilized. I'm talking specifically about the folks that have really geared up around the hashtag resistance. Anybody who's against Trump, we're going to welcome to the resistance, right? I'm not talking about DSA. I'm not talking about, um, uh, well, I- indivisible has been less, less active lately too, as well. But I think, well, I think it's some of it's like, we just got off of two years of nonstop. Exactly activism campaigning i think it's time i think we i think there's also should be like some leeway to take a few months off right and but i think emotional like orgy that just like happened with the elections and like that release of energy and stuff like that like absolutely the the question is this right is that when we get back into this and i think that the potential the 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 potential downfall of moving forward because i think that people are taking a break right now i mean trying i mean just trying to kind of like gear like rest the and problem, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, no, no, no. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it, right? So, but the but what happens when but the, the cap things start to gear up again? My concern is right is that everything is going to start getting channeled strictly into electoral politics, right? In the sense that whose campaign are you lining up next to? Whereas I think that what is going to be really, really important moving forward is that the, the those organizations like Indivisible, like DSA, like um, you know, kind of the Women's March, like basically continue to organize independently of campaigns right because ultimately that's the movement that's got to that's got to stay powerful um, kind of moving forward because whoever gets elected we're going to need to hold those people's feet to the fire right and so and this is also the kind of influence that we can have on the campaign and this course on the campaign is going to happen in very like, a lot from outside the campaigns Right. So the organizations that are going to be, you know, people, these presidential candidates are going to be trying to get people on board with them to help kind of like, you know, I don't know, supplement their name recognition and supplement their branding. So that's going to be really important to keep those things going. So it was a good piece by um, by Iglesias um, and something to kind of be, I guess, you know, considering to think about. So. Yeah. So uh, if you need if you need any kind of laugh this week, uh, you need to just do two two things. Go check out the links uh, to Hick and Looper um, and uh, him having his disastrous debut on CNN Town Hall kind of thing. And please go check out everything that you can. Just ended real quickly. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Well, you know he's making room at least. That's good. Um, so at least the stage a little less crowded now. <laughs> Um, but uh, and then go check out everything you can about uh, Devin Nunez, uh, his lawsuit, um, and some of the tweets are just really hilarious. So, um, anyways, uh, a whole lot of crazy stuff in so many different directions this week. Um, but I want to remind everybody, if you can, please uh, become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as five bucks a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash slash RC Press. You can become a member for as little as five bucks a month. If you become a member now, right through the end of April, I guess. Um, at the ten dollar a month level, I will send you David Wallace Wells's book, The Uninhabitable Earth: Life After Warming, which is, in my mind, absolutely essential reading for anybody right now to get your head around and get in the game on climate change because it is um, it is that kind of future. So, anyways, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll be right back after this quick break. <laughs> I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. At some time during your life, you've probably read a book or heard a story by Mark Twain. But did you know that this renowned American author was also a strong supporter of labor? In 1835, he was born Samuel Clemens in the town of Hannibal, Missouri. His father died of pneumonia when Samuel was only 11. 
The next year, he became a printer's apprentice, working for four years for little pay, often under horrible conditions. As a young man, he tried his hand as a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River and as a miner in Nevada and California. He took inspiration from the people and stories he encountered on his travels, writing under the pen name Mark Twain. Twain was a lifelong member of the International Typographical Union. And on this day in labor history, the year was 1886. Mark Twain delivered a powerful speech to the Monday Evening Club in Hartford, Connecticut. In it, he imagined the power of a united labor movement. He said, when all the bricklayers and all the machinists and all the miners and blacksmiths and printers and hod carriers and stevedores and house painters and brakemen and engineers and factory hands and all the shop girls and all of the sewing machine women and all of the telegraph operators, in a word, all the myriads of toilers in whom is slumbering the reality of that thing which you call power. When these rise, Call the vast spectacle by any deluding name that will please your ear, but the fact remains that a nation has risen. In his speech, Twain painted a vivid picture of workers and of the nation rising together as one. As attacks against unions and working people mount today, now more than ever, we need such a vision of solidarity. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Welcome back to Raging Chicken's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press, here with Sean Kishin once again. Allow me to just to uh, slip out of my luxurious white glove and get back to work. <laughs> so, Sean, man, what's going on? Um, nothing much. Here in PA. Kind of a uh, big no. week, kind of an interesting week. Nah, it was okay. No, really? <laughs> Another one of these weeks? <laughs> uh, a little bit. There's a little bit of action going on in the kids' house this week. Um, it's been unusually quiet uh, with the Republicans uh, this year, and it seems like they might be afraid of uh, getting their asses kicked again in an upcoming election. Mm-hmm. And really nothing too much has been going on, but... Uh, they tried to fast track an anti-union uh, Janus bill through the uh, legislature this week, which last summer they had, or last fall they had a uh, hearing on this bill uh, that Katie Clunk wrote. It would basically uh, force the allow force the state uh, state employers, public employers, to uh, notify union members, employees every two weeks with their paychecks that they have the right to opt out of their unions. Uh, that bill did not go anywhere. It was reintroduced this year, and they only said you could you can opt. You have the chance. They 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 rolled back a couple of the main provisions in the bill. It's still a really bad bill. The unions are not stepping on this at all. Uh, which like the Republicans thought that they would have. Like, hey, we made it less bad, so you're not going to support this this time around. Like they try. They're, they're trying to set up like a framework. But they're trying to like throw a bone out there. That, like, hey, we're being the civil ones with this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, notify the union, notify employees once a year that they can opt out. And then it also rolls back the automatic uh, dues deductions, the pay- paycheck deception language they added in the bill the last time. And so they're still going for these bills that didn't pass while Corbett was in office and aren't passing now. Um, and simply to uh, push carry water for the Commonwealth Foundation and other anti union groups in the state. Who. Whole lot to digest there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you have and you had there was uh, um, some great video that came out this week too, as well as uh, um, um, of some of that session, which was pretty cool too, as well. Because I think it's really important that um, that people are going to pay kind of attention to this. Is there's, I, mean, I have to say, it's been good to see some um, at least like see some bits and pieces coming out on Twitter here and there. Um, some Democratic lawmakers who are really. Um, um, kind of doing some good work and not allowing this um, to move forward. So, um, yeah. That's... So, like, in committee, um, the Democrats tried to do a gut and replace mm-hmm. with the bill um, on uh, the to include uh, the work to gut the language of this bill out and replace it with uh, the Workforce Protection Act. I think, or um, one of the bill, like Leanne Brannigan had it in her messaging. And they caused like a 20 minute conversation 
it derailed the whole entire hearing. Uh, the Republican it de- because the Republicans brought up the issue of germaneness, and we got a firsthand debate on germane. What what germane means <laughs> in the legislature? First year, first time in four years I've ever seen this happen. <laughs> That's good. And like the Republicans overruled the amendment, saying that it was not germane to the original language of the bill. Well, hey. uh, they, they actually brought Mason's manual for this, too. Good, <laughs> so, yeah, good man. Um, throw throw the sand right into the gears. So, um, it but the bill ended up passing. Um, Harkins had a really good thing. Like as you saw last year, when we walked out of committee, they still passed these bills out of committee regardless without us. So instead of walking out all the time, we're going to stay here and we're going to be loud and we're going to be proud and we're going to let the public know that what these the intentions of these bills are. And uh, throw some uh, light on what the Republicans are doing. Um, so this bill passed out committee um, went through first consideration, went through second consideration. Uh, it was on Wednesday where they tried to um, try to pass it out of third consideration and then for a final four vote. And usually the bills on consideration pass with no objection, right? They're more like a voice vote, not even like a voice vote. They just, you know, you just vote the pass. You don't, you don't raise objections to uh, move the stuff along the process. Mm-hmm. Um, what Dermody did this week uh, stood up and demanded a floor, a floor vote on second consideration on this bill at that time in place when – you know, and Republicans didn't have the votes. Either they weren't in the chamber or they just didn't have the votes, period. Mm-hmm. And the bill's been stalled for now. Well, good. You know, I think that you know, this- I mean, they could probably sit back, pass it out of the House whenever they want. Right. But uh, this bill's been killed for the time being. Well, this stuff is so important. I'm like, I'm so glad that, you know, um, that you pay attention to this stuff so closely because it's, you know, like we've said multiple times, is like this is where I can and, and learn this bill strategy. Is really- this bill, the, the the objection of this bill is to go after orientation of new member, new employee, new state employees, new state employee orientation. Right. Um, basically, their the goal of this bill is to inform members, uh, incoming employees, that they have the right to not join a union and they also have the right to opt out of the fair share. Um, now, this provision, the old bill, this new bill allows for fair share members to exist. Uh, where the old bill didn't, and mm-hmm. that's one of the concession, quote unquote, concessions they made. I think I believe it was one of the concessions, but like their whole game plan is that if the Republican, if the right wing pressure groups like the Commonwealth Foundation, the anti union groups out there get to the orientation process before the unions do, they have a better chance of making sure that person does not become a union member. Right. If unions get to unions talk, if the shop steward, you have a good shop steward there, they talk to this new employee on the first day and they get these people signed up into the union or for fair shares. Odds are that Commonwealth Foundation and other groups in the state will not get their these people to opt out of the unions. And this is where they failed. Like um, a lot of people thought that the the Janus decision was going to be the death blow to unions. Um, And really, it hasn't been uh, because like there's these organizations are paper tigers essentially they're fangless uh when you organize against them and like they don't do much mm-hmm. yep but i mean the key the key part of what you just said there is like is when you organize against them and i think that's where you see kind of unions have been stepping that up um, yeah which which has made all the difference yeah and when you organize against them they don't become a mem- they, they 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 don't do this, uh, you know. The, when they, they 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 don't fall for the 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 speak coming out of the um, Commonwealth Foundation and stuff like that, and you know they 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 they, they become members. And really, this is all this bill is, is designed to do is to defund, uh, is to destroy their political opponents in public. Yep, that's pretty much been their mo for the past twenty years. Yep. So at this uh, point. Yep. So not moving away from that. That's for sure. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. And then so what's happening here, too, as well is like a stuff going about uh, safe patient ratios also making it to the Capitol this week. Yes, this is an issue. Uh, <clears throat> this is actually something I work with this weekend or this week. Uh, 
SEIU Healthcare PA, PASNAP, and the Coalition of Nurses, which I believe non-union nurses are involved in this coalition for uh, safe patient ratios in the hospitals, which everyone needs because one day you'll end up in a hospital and you don't want your nurse to have 20 other patients to care about because that means that you're not going to be getting the proper treatment and attention. And a lot of preventable deaths are due to overstaffed or over like worked hospital people, like officials and stuff like right, that. Right. Um, you have more, uh, a lot of deaths and accidents from say people not washing their hands because they're rushing to get to the next patient issues like that, that can lead to an infection, uh, bacterial infection, MRSA and stuff like that. Like this is actually really important because safe ratios, you know, a lot slows the process down. Right, um, exactly. And it's, you know, it's just a basic, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of these things that's kind of virtually common sense, right? If you have a nurse, right, you want you want that patient ratio to be low, <laughs> right, in yeah. order to make sure that you're enhancing healthcare, right? And matter of fact, you know, when I covered the uh, the strike down at... Um, and it's actually, this is stuff that could be fixed with, like, universal healthcare. Yeah, that's right. No, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that's exactly. Right. When I covered the, the, the nurses' strike down at Crozier, if you remember that kind of last year, um, and I went down and I kind of interviewed a bunch of the nurses and wrote some stories about the nurses and things like this, that was front and center to what was at stake in that strike was that had everything to do with um, the, the safe patient ratios, right? Um, and, you know, and the thing is, is that, you know, organized nurses, nurses are freaking awesome, right? Um, because they know what the hell they're doing, right? And they, like, they're, they care so deeply about their patients, right, that they're willing to kind of do this stuff. So it's like, you know, um, it's really great to see this kind of moving forward once again. Uh, I mean, not that they ever stop, but to kind of see this actually kind of making it into the Capitol and having this kind of united front and pushing for this. So I'm very, very psyched about that. Yes. Well, cool. Um, and then um, I also followed the nurses around yeah. that day and I shot video for uh, Healthcare PA and photos. I got a couple of photos up on my Twitter account from the rally. And I'll be sent, I'll be sending a bunch of video over to Healthcare PA and yeah no it was a it's a really easy it, it was a, it was a fun day following these people around and actually getting to learn like about them and their working and everything because awesome. you know what's that <laughs> they're awesome yeah and it's like these aren't like yeah these are actually working people coming to the Capitol on their days off to do this shit yep like and these aren't like people that work yeah yeah awesome awesome people very very cool yes. Um, so, uh, also, well, before we get, before we get to the, um, the, um, the budget and policy center conference, now I understand, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but, um, I understand that, uh, somebody else was active this week. There will, there... Oh yes. We forgot about this. Yeah. We forgot about, there will, there will not um, I thought we should just at least put this on people's radar. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is something I will be going to. This is a nice little preview for next week's podcast. We don't have any material yet since it hasn't happened. Right. <laughs> but uh, I guarantee you that, you know, the, there will be uh, some some very great thoughts coming out of the intellectual depths of hell uh, <laughs> this, this Wednesday morning. <laughs> uh, Daryl Metcalf is bringing a climate denier, an inconvenient, fa- inconvenient author of Inconvenient Facts. Uh, his name's Gregory Wrightstone. He is from the Heartland Institute. He is a geologist out of Pittsburgh, which doesn't give you a fucking any credentials when it comes to climate science at all. Yes, you're a geologist. Congratulations. You study rocks. Like, there are, like, yes. I mean, I hate to sound like that disconcerting about it, but, like, you're not a physicist, you're not a geographer, and you're not a climatologist. You're a you're someone in a completely different field of science with geology, which deals with the earth and all that you, you you have a master's degree in geology. You're, you're not a PhD scientist writing peer reviewed articles going against the grain with climate science. Uh, this is a total climate, climate denier, flat earther coming in here. And yeah, this is going to be Wednesday morning, eight 30 in the fucking morning, wow. <laughs> which <Wow>. means <laughs> I'll be getting up extra early on Wednesday and I'll be extra grumpy. <laughs> Hey, you, you know what? Uh, you, you know what I, I, I hear really helps get, get you out of the morning, uh, get you up nice, uh, out of bed, nice and early in the morning for a Daryl Metcalf uh, um, uh, hearing. What's that? 
Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> I, might, I, I, might, I might be bringing one of my muffins with me. I'm not sure. There you go. Well, you know, the muffin man, the muffin man. <laughs> Drury Lane. That's where Sean's going. Drury Lane. <laughs> As I said, like before, and I'll say this again. Yeah. If there was a shortage on stupid in Harrisburg, hundreds of people would be out of jobs. Like, at least a thousand, I would say, would be out of a job if, like, we actually did send our best and brightest to Harrisburg. Well, you know, again, it is, it is, is you know, it's one of these things, at least it's a renewable resource. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's naturally produced gas. <laughs> yeah, he's got to feed that crap. <laughs> Um, uh, one other thing I should mention, because actually, you know, I was thinking about this. Uh, we might be able to uh, meet up briefly at least uh, next Wednesday, because I'm actually going to be in the Capitol next Wednesday. Will you really? For yeah, what? because there is the uh, the PA Promise Rally. Oh, yes. I was asked to go to that. Yeah. PA Promise I Rally. Maybe, I don't know. What's that? <laughs> no, someone asked me. Uh, I was talking to Sean Cramps earlier this week. He's like, you're going to come to our rally next week? I said, what day is this? It's Wednesday. I was like. I might be able to make it. I know a lot of work there in the morning. You gotta like, yeah, you, know, you might, you know, like, you know, I've got to be there eight thirty in the morning. I mean, like, after two hours of that, you're pretty much spent for the day, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you pretty much are at that point. Oh God. <laughs> well, I mean, like, come on, now. you got to deal with Daryl Metcalf for two hours first thing in the morning. That, that's like. Dude, that's like... I remember watching Teletubbies at that point. Dude, but that's the point, right? I mean, it's like... But it's in real life. I mean, that's the that's the kind of whatever... Yeah, that's why I like it. The crazy it. about <laughs> it. The crazy keeps you going. That's the thing. But yeah. uh, no, but I just just for everybody out there, so Wednesday, March 27th, that's again next Wednesday from 11 to 12 p.m. I'm sorry I didn't mention this in the in the intro today. Um, I meant to, but um, 11 to 12 p.m. in a rally in the state capitol for the PA Promise. Remember, the PA Promise is legislation that would bring um, tuition-free college um, to the state system of higher education, right? Those obviously some qualifications with it, right? But um, it is the best bill that we've got going right now, at least for something that gets us toward uh, 100% universal um, tuition-free college. Um, this is a, definitely a step in that direction. It mirrors very much what they did in New York State with the SUNY system um, and what's happening in New York City in the CUNY system and what's happening with the states that are surrounding um, Pennsylvania. So once again, Pennsylvania starts getting worried because everyone else is doing it, so we better hop on board and do something about it, um, uh, which is which is going to be pretty cool. So um, I will be there um, in the state capitol for the PA Promise Rally. I know that if you are listening from any of the state system of higher education um, campuses, the um, most of the, as far or all, um, I want to say all, um, should be all, um, campuses will be, uh, the faculty union will be supporting buses that will be going from um, from the college campuses out to the um, out to the rally. Um, I'm going to be there both as a union member, but I'm going to drive out independently as a member of uh, uh, for Raging Chicken to cover that for Raging Chicken. Um, so um, you want to get on board if you're at Kutztown University, if you're at Millsville, if you're at Westchester, if you're at any of the state system of higher education thing, contact the faculty union and get um, so you can get on board the bus um, to head to Harrisburg uh, for this rally. Um, it is the uh, it is really is kind of an opportunity of a lifetime um, to push this kind of legislation forward. So that's going to be a really cool thing. So I'm going to try to get out there as early as I can. I have to drop my kids off of school, and I'm probably just going to go right from there. Um, so, uh, but I'll let you know when we get closer to that. So we'll have a kind of a report on that too as well. Um, uh, maybe we can uh, um, touch base quickly and even do some uh, a little Facebook live stream or something like that. Just a little update of what's happening. Yeah, maybe we can grab a beer or some water. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> just some water, right? Because you're not beer. Because you're not drinking beer. I'm I am not. not. I'm not going to freaking knock you off the wagon. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Right. So crazy. So the other big thing this week, too, as well, which I really wanted to be there for, but there's just no way I can get there in the middle of the day on a Thursday. But um, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center had its uh, annual budget summit this week. Yes, they did. And you were there? Yes, I was. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ. It's fucking it's like I feel like I'm a dentist. (laughs) Let me yank that out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, um, I was there yesterday. Uh, I was in a couple of good panels. Um, big highlight of the day, uh, Saru. I cannot pronounce her last name. She oh, yeah. is the woman who runs Saru Jaya Raman. Saru Jaya, Jaya Raman. Raman. Yeah. Jaya Raman. Uh, she is from Stanford. She's a 
professor over at Stanford. She is the creator, the founder of uh, Restaurant Opportunity Center, Rock United, which is uh, for restaurant workers across the country. Um, one of their their big campaign is pushing for one fair wage and getting rid of the tip minimum wage. She gave a really great detailed history of the tip minimum wage and tipping in this country yesterday and how it is rooted in racism and rooted in like post abolitionist like southern segregation pretty much like she was laying it down so uh one of the big groups she was talking against was uh the nra national restaurant association Mm -hmm. and do you want to take a guess when they were founded when were they founded Uh, 1900 earlier than that earlier than that Yes. Wow. So they were found right after the Emancipation of Proclamation, the emancipation of all the slaves. And Isn't that interesting? They are rooted in this European ideology at the time of tipping. So Americans in mm. post-slavery America, you know, as the emancipation happened, they restaurant and food service workers and service workers back then implement a tipped tipping system as a way of keeping newly freed slaves in economic bondage. And one of the things that is one of the biggest proponents, uh, you have a bunch of allies, liberal allies out there like Cuomo and others who, who are giving, who are going after, say yes, they will go after the tip minimum wage, who are then signing $15 an hour minimum wage bills that still keep a tip minimum wage in there. And one of the biggest things that the um, National Restaurant Association does they get white affluent um, servers from high end restaurants who make a ton of money on tips and pretty much use this the us against them. Uh, pay one half of the working class to go after the other half. Yep, there you go. And pretty much their argument is why should they, they being those poor black single mothers who are working in the diners, get the same minimum wage, get the same $15 an hour wage as me? working in a fancy restaurant making tens of thousands of dollars or making like fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year in tips. So messed up. Yeah. So like this is a strategy they're use they are they're using around the country uh to keep tip minimum wages in place. And she was giving us pointers on what to look out for during our tip minimum uh during the flight to raise the wage and making sure there's one fair wage. Also one of the things I did yesterday after she talked at the first um session, she ran over to the Capitol and they had a thing where uh, Jordan Harris and uh, Joanna McClinton were both working in the Capitol cafeteria, flipping burgers, doing food service work for the day to see what the actual service workers do, which is actually pretty cool because it's not going to a soup kitchen. It's, you're going, you're serving the people you work with every day right? behind the counter. And that's pretty powerful, like optically. So I'll say that's pretty freaking awesome. Yes. So they're doing everything they can in Pennsylvania to make sure that tipped workers, the tip minimum wage is eliminated. Um, the other panel that was there was um, one pencil, one PA was on that uh, mm-hmm. PA spotlight and SEIU. So it was a nice, it, it was a, it was a good panel to go to. Uh, didn't really do anything in the afternoon panel. Uh, listened to Eugene D. Pasquale speak and, you know, spent like the, the afternoon sitting around talking, catching up with people who, haven't seen in a bit. So that was fun. Very cool. Very cool. It's uh, that, always nice getting out to those things. Well, I'll tell you, that's, that is one, you know, again, that can sound that it's like completely, completely boring to everyone, but I'm telling you, that is so good. I, I, I want to go to that every single year and every single year, it's just like, a, like in the middle of the day on my heavy teaching load yeah, days. It's always on a Wednesday or a Thursday in the middle of the week. Yeah. But all I think like what this does is what's really good is that, um, I mean, it brings people together. And people were not enthusiastic about the the budget the governor proposed. Right. Um, people didn't come out and say it, but that was pretty much general consensus, especially around the cash assistance programs, uh, cutting cash assistance funds, putting those funds into health or into housing subsidies, which do nothing. Like, let's face it, cash assistance is the best anti-poverty program out there. Yep. I'm sure if you ask a poor person. That if you tell a poor person who's on cash assistance, sorry, you're going to get more money for housing, you're not going to get the cash, they're going to still ask, where the fuck is my cash at? Right. And because people spend money. Well, I was telling you, I almost had... <laughs> people money, they spend it. Yeah. Like, 
I almost had a I almost had a, 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 a sound drop today by uh, from Rutger Bergman, um, who's got that book Utopia for Realists, and he's been out as being a strong advocate for um, for for uh, UBI Universal Basic Income, and it makes exactly this case. The problem when you're poor, your main problem is you don't have money, <laughs> right? <laughs> and actually, it's a more efficient use of money to actually just give people money. Right. I mean, this, but anyways, that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. I mean, when you give poor people money, they spend it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you take money away and put it in the housing subsidies, they don't spend it. And that means that crime goes up. They don't have the ends to like that extra $200 a month can make sure they have an extra couple of meals there on your table. Yep. Making sure people are getting food, making sure they're getting their money. No one gives a fuck about the housing subsidies in that situation. That is correct, sir. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. I mean, like, the problem is you don't have money to pay your rent, to buy your food, and think, and then suddenly you have money so you can pay your rent and buy your food. <laughs> Guess what? We're going to take your money away. But we're going to give you a little bit more of a break towards housing. Right. It's just, it's just not. It's just not. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that in the real world. Another thing that people said that was actually really good, these special funds in the DEP are not meant to be transfer funds. They are meant to go to the communities that they serve. You know, people were against that in 2015 when the Republicans proposed it, and they are still against it today when Tom Wolf has proposed it with this budget. Yeah, good. Good on them. So, I mean, yeah, like there, there is discontent with uh, the budget that was in- introduced by the governor's office. And, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I can't – those are the two main sticking points. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Well, lots of good stuff. So anything else going on around the state? Um. <clears throat> <laughs> no, nothing really too much. Well, I do ca- I do know there's going to be a lot there's some uh there's a lot of stuff that's gearing up um for it's the spring be over the next few weeks once the budget season starts rolling out. Yeah. I've already been hearing from um, through some back channels from different organizations that are looking for um, doing kind of mobilizing a bunch of stuff. So that's going to be um, I, I expect we're going to see a lot more activity um, kind of moving forward. So and I think that I, I just have a feeling about this. I don't know this for sure. But next week seems to be when when this stuff is going to start picking up. So um, so hopefully, you know, we yeah, can I would say first week of I, I, I'm, I'm still thinking it's going to start picking up. It's all going to happen like in May, like when we were shooting the doing the video work the other day. I mean, it was Penn State Day up the Capitol and you're just, we're going to start having those days where there's like a thousand, two thousand school children in the Capitol right, going right, everywhere. Right. And that's when it gets really fun. <laughs> I mean, as much as I hate like this time of the year, these three months. Because all the shit that's just going on at once, it's actually pretty fun being in the Capitol when there's like 5,000 people moving about the building. And yeah. You're just, yeah. Yeah. People's house, man. It's a people's house. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, this is uh, Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Uh, when we come back right after this break, we will get into today's last call. <laughs> This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Welcome back. 
the Raging Chickens Out the Coop podcast. It's today's last call where we talk about space news and beer and whatever else we feel like talking about. Just kind of put a fun note in the closing of the day. Um, today, uh, I'll give you the rundown of Space News Reel. But right now, actually, I have to admit, I'm a little distracted out of my uh, kind of right eye because I have the stream, the live stream that is on. It's a, right now, there's a six and a half an hour uh, spacewalk that is going on where they are swapping out um, the batteries on the International Space Station. They're uh, bringing, putting in lithium ion batteries. And uh, what's really freaking cool about this time is that you've got um, all, it looks like, you know, pretty close to high def cameras on on all the spacesuits, and so you can kind of watch them do their job. And uh, if I had more time in my life, I would just sit and watch the entire six and a half hours of it. But uh, that's pretty cool. Um, they're out there doing that. Um, just 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 amazing to me. Still amazing to me. Um, but uh, so this week, yes, the big push is uh, the moon. And, uh, you know, uh, we talked about this a little bit last week. And by 2020, the idea is to uh, have humans back on the moon. That's what NASA has been gearing up towards. We had Jim Bridenstine, who's the, uh, the head of NASA, basically come out last week and say, look, the SLS of the space launch system that is kind of like uh, NASA has been working on has been always po- postponed, postponed, postponed. Um, they're actually looking to potentially abandon that and turn to the commercial sector, surprise, surprise, um, to launch the Orion spacecraft that will uh, eventually kind of uh, help bring um, both humans back to the moon and um, to bring up modules that will uh, start on building the space station, the lunar gateway, um, the space station that will orbit the moon. So um, if you kind of are still in the, yeah, it's a bunch of science fiction thing, this is really pushing, uh, they're pushing the limits on this. And we got Mike Pence. This week, the National Space Council is going to be meeting with NASA, and they're going to be putting some real pressure on NASA to make sure that they hit that June deadline uh, for 2020 um, to get humans on the moon. And I just want to remind everybody what else is happening in 2020. Um, That would also be election year. Right. Um, And so it's interesting, at least, that if we have uh, people going to be landing back on the moon um, in the summer before the election, uh, what is that going to do to our overall discourse? What's that over going to do to the politics of the situation? I don't know. Um, But I know the one thing that will be important is that um, that uh, you take out all the stock you can in Preparation H um, because uh, NASA came out with research this week that said the longer people stay up in space, the more likely their herpes coming back. (laughs) <laughs> a gift that never stops giving. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So they find actually, you know, and that, you know, herpes, of course, is, you know, yes, there's kind of like, you know, the herpes, the kind of genital herpes that you know about, but it's also like chicken pox, right? Small pox and things like this, um, <laughs> cold sores and stuff. All that stuff starting to pop back out. So the shingles, right? You know, uh, and they're finding that something about um, th- what they think it is, is they think it's it's primarily because your body is undergoing so much stress. Right. Um, even though, you know, it's zero G, your body is actually undergoing quite a bit of stress in space. Um, and that is kind of like causing this stuff to kind of come out once again. So I got a cure for that. Oh, do you? Yeah, it's a really good stress reliever. Oh, what is that? Uh, no, I can't really say. Is it called Space Ganja Man? <laughs> 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 that would be actually really interesting to see what would that what that would actually do. Um, to all, I mean, obviously you can't have people like completely stoned off their mind when they're kind of like. I wonder, you know, like, if you were an astronaut, yeah. right? And you just got like completely ripped uh, for taking like for going up into orbit, like like that, like ten minutes. Like, yeah. I wonder what that experience would be like on the th- feeling the thrusters and all that stuff. I mean. Well, I'll tell you, you you know, if you're gonna have like uh, 200 grand that you got that you want to spend, you're gonna be able to do that pretty soon. I don't even want to do it like in an airplane. I want to go like in a rocket. That's what I'm talking about. In a shuttle, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Um, Elon Musk. I didn't put this in the notes, but Elon Musk this week was uh, talking about they're getting close to testing their first. Uh, I forget exactly what it's called, but this, they have this big, the Starliner ship, right? That is eventually what they're, they want to use to get the Mars and also to ferrying things back and forth to, uh, uh, to the moon. But as part of that project, right, that they have to use that same thing that's going to do these, um, you know, these flights, basically rocket flights from, say, the U.S. to China, right? Which will take you like the, on the other side of the world in something like three hours or something like this. Right. Um, and they they are they say that they're going to go th- uh, do some testing on this. I'm highly skeptical that they're going to get to any of this stuff. I think this is a lot about fundraising at this point. Um, but it's uh, but, but we shall see. We shall see. 
So the, what, the other thing that caught my eye this week, if you go back kind of some previous episodes when uh, kind of a while ago when I've been really hitting the kind of galactic capitalist um, notes pretty hard, um, this week you had basically, a re, you know, they, they were kind of like out in front um, talking about the moon as like the eighth continent. Right. And thinking about it, particularly as um, a space for extraction. Um, if you remember, uh, China has just land a, landed a probe on the dark side of the moon. And basically what it's doing is it's it's uh, kind of measuring kind of what's inside the moon. And also NASA had a lander. Um, well, that's a good one on Mars, but uh, had another lander that's kind of kind of measuring the planets there to see what's kind of inside of it. And what they're finding about the moon is that there's more water on the moon than they thought. Right. But it's buried in layers of ice deep and all this other kinds of stuff. And in order to make rocket fuel, of course, you have to have water. Right. And that becomes the thing. So what they're actually thinking about is like one of the first things that they want to kind of commercialize um, Mm -hmm. is the mining of the moon. Um, And like I can tell you, right, this is pretty standard procedure for any science fiction novel that's ever been written. (laughs) And that's kind of where they're going. So uh, to make it other uh, also real. Um, Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency, it's like basically they're NASA, um, they are kind of contracting with Toyota to um, get together a really kind of funky-looking off-road lunar rover that will basically be a large pressurized vehicle, so you don't want me to need to be in spacesuits. So, like, once again, everything that you see in kind of science fiction about some rover on the moon or another planet, these big in- inside space where you're kind of, you know, uh, it's a pressurized cabin, that's a Toyota is going to start building. The privatization um, of the last frontier. That's exactly. The other thing that was said this week that came out of uh, Bridenstine inside the National uh, um, National Space Council is that there's going to be an increased push. This came from the Galactic Capitalists, actually, but it's gonna, you know it's echoed in some of their other stuff, a NASA and National Space Council stuff, is that uh, that the first step towards the commercialization of space will necessarily be the privatization of the International Space Station because there's too much competition for the with the government stuff. So... Uh, Again, it's the, all the, the – everything's lining up here. So so we'll see. Uh, and Boeing, I think in the wake of the 737, they're like, eh, maybe we should get our planes fixed before we start kind of launching off capsules. <laughs> uh, maybe we should do that before we start killing more people. Um, so that's going to be pushed off. Like I said last time, we expected that to happen, that um, you know, you, the delays are kind of pretty common. Um, Simply like you're dealing with so much different stuff. So pretty wild. So that's what I got for space news this week. Uh, the other thing was, you know, was interesting this week, Sean, is that there was this, I don't know, this guy just kept on popping up all over Twitter, right, in just weird spaces. And I think you might have even run across them in the Capitol. Yeah. It was this weird person wearing, like, a bright track jacket, like, a really off-color, like, track jacket. And I, thought it was a guy, I thought it was a guy from The Sopranos at first. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was this guy named Mark. Uh, Mark Price. Hey, yeah. d- does he live down by the river? I think so. Um, I, I know he has his office in Harrisburg. Huh. That he's always sitting in on using Twitter. Huh. And like drinking tea. I think he's an economist, but I never really see him doing anything besides walking around State Street. Well, I saw this picture. But I don't know if he's like panhandling for money, and that's just his like cover. Well, I was, you know, because I was watching stuff like some of the stuff from the uh, the Budget and Policy Center. There were some rallies that were taking place in the Capitol. And there was that dude who's like right in the middle of it all, except he wasn't really paying attention to what was going on around. He was like looking down in that track jacket, like, and looked like he was on his phone. Yeah, he was on his cell phone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. So wow. we, we started subtweeting this guy, this Gen Xer, and he didn't like it. <laughs> 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 and he actually. So uh, we're, we 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 had a fun day yesterday busting on Mark Price, <laughs> Budget and Policy Center, Keystone Research Center, labor economist. Uh, he was uh, sticking out like a sore thumb <laughs> in the Capitol at a rally on his cell phone, and uh, pretty much like, hey, we, so he likes to come at a few of us for being millennials on Twitter all the time. So we took, we, we decided to take a shot at him on the same thing, play, reversing it on his, on his way. And so like at, so this was happening simultaneously, me and uh, with another person, Sean Cramsey, Sean works over at AppScuff. Uh, we're just like, Hey, look, Gen Xer discovered a smartphone and it's price looking down <laughs> at his phone. And then as that same, as I shot that tweet off simultaneously, 
Sean shot off a tweet saying, uh, known millennial hater seen using cell phone in the middle of press conference. <laughs> <laughs> it was so, uh, I laughed started, so hard when I saw that. I laughed so hard. It was the funniest shit. Yeah, we started, like, we started like taking shots at him real quickly. It was pretty fun. <laughs> Nothing but love, Mark. Nothing but love, Mark. <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, crazy. So, uh, and that's the type of fun we insiders like to have in Harrisburg. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> You know, we call that an afternoon in our world. <laughs> a fun afternoon. <laughs> what were you doing? Oh, we were tweeting about a local economist in a tracksuit who was tweeting in the middle of a rally. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny you knock your socks off, I tell you. <laughs> no, it was it was hilarious. Hey, you gotta make your environment work for you sometimes. Yeah, you know exactly. What I mean? Exactly, man. Uh, and so, Sean, you said that uh, before we went on the show today, you said it's been two weeks now. Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks beerless. And alcoholist, too. And no, alcoholist. No whiskey, no, like, beer for the past two weeks. It's a good way to drop 15 pounds. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> drop it quickly. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping it's going to work for me. I tell you, I tell you, I was thinking about you last night because I was like, you know, I was like, oh, I was like it's going to do a little bit going through some of the articles for today's show and stuff. And uh, of course, Thursday night's a Star Trek Discovery. Right. And I actually missed last week's episode because I had too much other work to do. So I watched back to back episodes last night and I said that, you know, usually it's like Friday. I don't have to go in to work. I use the afternoons to kind of do grading and stuff at home. But we do the podcast in the morning. So Thursday nights are usually like, ah, sit back, watch some Star Trek and have a beer. Right. And last night I'm sitting there like, you know, I really don't feel like a beer. And Sean's not doing it. So I'm going to be in solidarity with Sean. I'm not going to have a beer. <laughs> so I didn't have a well, beer either. I mean, so this is actually like something I've been like wanting to do for a while. Right. Yeah. And it, I mean, like started off last like football season, I would go Sundays without having a beer. And like pretty much like changed my diet around to the point where. Where I wasn't at the bar, <laughs> having beer, you know, grilling stuff all the time, um, making like usually having potatoes, spinach, carrots, pretty simple like meals and making them any which way, trying to switch up with variety. Um, you know, I eat a lot of fruit, uh, bananas, strawberries, pineapple or like some cantaloupe are my favorite things to eat. Mm -hmm. And it's like. After I did the math with how many calories a week I was consuming yeah, in yeah. just beer, I was just like, yeah, this is, this is just unsta <laughs> unsustainable yeah. and not healthy at the same time. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and, like, yeah, I haven't – I might have gone out twice within the past three weeks to get takeout. So I've been actually, like – and that's where the other change is that, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, my beer munchies are worse than any other type of munchies. And it's like – I could sit down, I could smoke, and I will not pig out on food, but if you put three or four beers in me, then yes, I will be ordering wings or fries or going down getting pizza or devouring a bag of chips and stuff like that. So it's like, yeah, it was just cut back and yeah. Well, no, it's always, I mean, it's always good to see like the positive influences of Joe Rogan kind of taking hold. So. <laughs> I've been holding that one all day, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to be good to come around to this guy. He's got some good things to say. <laughs> I observe Rogan from a distance. Like, it... I actually had a, I actually had a, like, uh, I enjoyed, like, I mean, I listened to the Alex Honnold interview he had on a couple months ago. Yeah. Where he, you know how Alex Honnold is? No, no idea. He is the free climber. Uh, they did the free solo. Have you heard of this documentary? So he oh, free yes, yes, yes. So he free soloed El Cap in Yosemite. Yes. And so he was on there. Like, yeah, was, that's a really good interview. But, like, that's a documentary I want to see. But I have to pay for it. It's on Netflix yet. The other one I watched last week, uh, really good documentary if you're on Netflix. It's called The Dawn Wall, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have free solo which is like no ropes, nothing. Right, 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 right. And you have free climbing, which is like you have ropes, but you're using your hands and feet and you're hooking into the, the carabiners on the way up, right? right. And uh, Dawn Wall was the last remaining, it's like, the, it's just this flat face of El Cap. 
and it's the last face that not that was never climbed by like professional rock climbers. And this one person spent uh, five or six years, you know, creating the roots, the different like pitches on the wall. Mm. Uh, took years to do this, and him and his climbing partner um, finished the wall. It took him like twenty one days, twenty two days to climb the the dawn wall, which is like the hardest climbing route in the world Mm -hmm. that's been done and it will never be done again so that was a good like filling up my chunk on saturday night no good there you go and that's what i want to do i like well not that but like i want to get back into rock climbing and stuff like that but it's like you know dropping weight and making sure my my back is in shape too yeah yeah yeah, very cool. Uh, speaking of documentaries, I didn't mention this too as well, but I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm jonesing to get to the uh, the uh, Apollo Eleven, uh, the documentary. Have you ever heard of this thing? I think it was a spaceship, right? Yeah, I mean, have you heard of the documentary? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> well, what's cool? Is this one where they almost died? Um, Apollo Eleven? No, I don't think so. Right? Wait, let me just double check. I think that, I thought Apollo Eleven was one to the moon. Um, well, anyways, the um, the whole the whole um, the whole idea of this of this film, right? Um, yeah, it's the one that landed on the moon. Um, just want to make sure I had that right. Or... What's that? Was it the first moon landing? Yeah, they landed the first two people on the moon. Yep. Okay. So what what this documentary is about is I I knew about the documentary beforehand, um, and I you know, wanted to see it just because it's a space thing, right? And I, uh, and you know that's fascinating historically, but then I, I read a little bit more about it this week. Just for, I don't know why I was looking about maybe we'll go see a movie at some point soon. And what's fascinating about this one, which I cannot wait to see now, is that there's no narration in the entire thing. And the whole documentary is um, basically composed of this old footage, right? Kind of real footage um, from like mission control and all the cameras and all the kind of coverage that was actually happening. So it's it's all the kind of stuff from like the insider stuff that has a lot of stuff that has not been um, that's released. I think it's going to be fascinating. I just cannot wait to see this too. So my daughter's charged up too as well. So I want to go see it. So cool. Um, all right, so just a couple things in beer news this week. Uh, since uh, I don't want to tempt Sean too much, um, that uh, but although if you were doing, going to kind of like get, get close to the uh, uh, the tap handles again, uh, the probably the best time to do it would be uh, this Sunday at Free Will because uh, it's the March Meltdown 5K. Um, that's going to be held at the. It's going to start at the uh, the Percocy. Um, uh, free will, right? The free will brewing and perfect per- Percy PA. It's going to start there. It's going to be a 5K race. It takes place along these trails from the Perky Omen Creek. It's actually right where I walk my dog all the time. Um, and the it's open to runners and walkers of all ages. Uh, but you know, obviously, if you want to get your free uh, craft brew from Free Will, you have to be 21 years or older with a valid ID. Um, so that's it. 5K race at uh, the Percy. Free Will Brewing Company this Sunday from 10 to 1 p.m. Um, and then just kind of give a shout out to the latest release from Free Will, the Holographic Universe. That's coming out tomorrow on Saturday. Um, that is a sour ale with boysenberry, plum, sweet basil, milk sugar. Comes in at 6.4%. It's available in cans and on tap um, in the tap rooms at both locations, both in Percy and in Peddler's, Peddler's Village. So cool. So anything uh, kind of cool going on this weekend, Sean? Uh, no, but I got some Beto news. Oh, cool. Uh, Beto was asked if he became president, would he reunite the Mars Volta? Okay. <laughs> uh, and he said. Okay. okay. So the Mars Volta is a band I used to listen to. Uh, <laughs> it had Cedric Bixler Zavala and his cousin in there. Uh, they, were, they, they had a band in the 90s called At The Drive-In, post-hardcore punk band that was really mm-hmm. great. Um, and then they formed the Mars Volta, which is more of a psychedelic uh, concept band. They would release these epically long albums with songs that are like eight, nine, ten minutes long each on them. They yeah, were yeah. just freaking awesome. Yeah, they were cool. That was really cool. Yeah, and like uh, you know, one of my favorite albums is Francis the Mute. Uh, for any like uh, trivia out there, but uh, he said it would be an honor to have Mars the Mars Volta play anything along the campaign or in his presidency. So really, nothing much to it right there. Another vague answer. But this is the this is this is like how people are relating to him, right? He's the yeah. he's the cool hip guy, the hip punk rocker who sold out. Yeah, 
exactly. But still has that kind of like, you know, quasi edgy appeal that's safe for centrists, right? You yeah. Know? <laughs> Anyways. Well, very cool. Well, there we have it, everybody. Uh, hopefully we're going to, it looks like the sun is actually peeking out, at least on my on my end. It had been pouring for like like a day nonstop. The sun is now out. Uh, hopefully that sticks to six for the weekend. It looks like uh, I'm going to at least be spending a good day or so up in the mountains this weekend. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, especially since my my sleep apnea is getting more and more under control. I have got energy coming out of the pores, man. It's great. Um, so cool. Well, hey, Sean, man, have an awesome weekend. And uh, maybe we'll kind of uh, be able to kind of hook up on, on Wednesday and uh, check out things in the capital. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, maybe I'll get to see you out there. You sticking around or going back to Kutztown afterwards? No, well, I, I have to teach at three. So I have to decide if I if I'm gonna take a personal day and just kind of spend the whole time, or if I'm just gonna get back. Um, I usually take my my son to basketball on Thursday, on Wednesday nights too. So it's like, you know, um, come back. So I want you know I'll stick around for a little bit, but you know um, I'm probably gonna try to get back in time. All right, so, all right, man. Sounds good. Hey, have a good one. Uh, and hey, everybody, thanks for sticking with us on this Friday, the 22nd of March, as we approach April. This has been Kevin Mahoney and Sean Kitchen. Out the Coop Podcast, Radio Ticket Press. See ya! Specifically, Nunes calls out two parody accounts, which he says have repeatedly tweeted and retweeted abusive and hateful content. The first being an account called at Devin Nunes's mom. <laughs> wow. Cold. That is cold, That's John. Cold. That is ice cold. That's bed, embarrassing, man. seeing a parody account of your mom. But even more embarrassing is seeing it how it looks when written out in a formal lawsuit. Because the suit says, and I quote, In her endless barrage of tweets, Devin Nunez's mom maliciously attacked every aspect of Nunez's character. 